So welcome to this class uh, on empirical methods in software engineering. I am Alessio Ferrari. I am from the CNR, National Research Council. It's a research institution in Italy. And uh, if you want to drop me an email, please use this email or also the one from the University of Florence that I use when I send you uh, when I sent you my information uh, about this uh, about this um, about this course. So this course is dealing with uh, software engineering. So we are not just dealing with uh, programming, but with the whole ecosystem of uh, aspects that are related to uh, programming. So also testing, but also designing software, but also managing software engineers. Uh, and we are speaking about empirical methods. So empirical methods are uh, scientifically based methods to analyze the, um, the activities related to software engineering. But first of all, since I don't know which is your uh, specific background uh, in, uh, in software engineering, I will give you some, uh, uh, some indication of what uh, uh, or what we mean by software engineering. So what is our scope of interest? And then I will uh, give you a brief overview of what you will learn during, during this course. So first of all, what is software engineering? Software engineering, you, we can read the slide and then we comment, is the systematic design and development of software products and the management of the software process. process. So, uh, the key word here is design, development, and management. So it's not just coding, but also creating the architecture of the code, designing the code, planning for uh, the software engineering process, and managing the software engineering process. And another key word that is not read here is systematic. So systematic means that we have a set of strategies that we put into place to uh, to control the whole uh, software process. Let's read the second, the second point that, uh, uh, that tells us about the goals of software engineering. So it, we have software engineering as one uh, of its primary objective, the production of programs that meet specifications, are demonstrably accurate, produced on time and within budget. What does it mean? It means that the first goal of uh, uh, the software engineering discipline, because it's a, it's a discipline like math, let's say, or physics, is to create programs, so uh, running code, that is in agreement with what the customer wants, that meets specifications, so meets the description of what is expected from the software, are demonstrably accurate, so we can, uh, we can show that it meets the specification in a, in, a, in a way that can be, uh, can be demonstrated, can be proven, can be tested, okay? It's produced on time and within budget. These two aspects, time and budget, we will, of course, not touch so much in this course, but, uh, but I put them here because we have to consider that in any activity related to management, you always have to do with uh, aspects related to time and aspects related to budget. Like in any activity of uh, engineering, it's always a, a trade-off between uh, uh, effort that you can spend, time and money that you have and you can invest and objectives you want to achieve. Okay, so it's always an engineering problem is always an optimization problem. Uh, take this into account while, uh, while you think about software engineering. What is more in detail our scope? What will uh, we deal with during this, uh, during this uh, course? We will deal with a set of actors and uh, uh, a process, basically. Uh, what I was speaking, what I mentioned before was the software engineering process. Basically, what you see here in this slide is an extremely simplified version of the software engineering process that aims to build software that is in agreement with the specification. The, everything starts in the top left corner with a, a, a meeting between an analyst, uh, so called requirements analyst or business analyst or analyst in general, which is a, 
uh, a person or a set or a group of people that uh, interact somehow with the customer or the users, and I will detail later on the distinction between customers and users, and try to understand what they want. For example, if I am uh, um, working for a company, for a software company that needs to develop uh, uh, tools uh, for the management of hospitals, which are uh, particularly relevant in this moment, I have to interact with the management of the hospital. But of course, uh, it, most of the people that I will need to interact are also the doctors that may be possible user of, of my system. I will need to interact also with the uh, information technology manager of the hospital. So all these ecosystem of stakeholders, let's say, of people are the ones that I have to uh, start a dialogue to understand what are the requirements for my system. For example, let's imagine in this case that I need to develop a new system um, to allow uh, all the patients to record the status of fever, for example, or of cough, so that uh, I can know all the symptoms, uh, not just of the people that are there in the hospital, but also of the people that stay at home uh, in, this, uh, in this period. So to set up everything, uh, so to set up everything, I will have to interact also with the family, with the general practice doctors, so the family doctor, to understand what is uh, their typical uh, uh, process for visiting patients and uh, um, and for uh, uh, diagnosis and for notifying, for example, to the central hospital their disease. And uh, I have to understand whether a process is already in place or something uh, needs to be added. So this just to give you a glance of the complexity of this uh, starting point uh, and the need uh, of interaction with uh, several, several subjects and several stakeholders, okay? So once I have interacted with all these people, I can step to the second phase, which is the so-called requirements phase, in which I write down my requirements. Writing down the requirements means really writing down a document. This document uh, is a sort of contract, and for, uh, um, for a long time, it will be a living contract within the software process. Basically, in this document, you write down statements such as uh, uh, when the family doctor um, interacts with the patient and know that he has a fever, he has to write down the name of the patient and uh, uh, send, uh, press this button that sends the information to the central database of the hospital. So requirements are documents in which everything uh, is it's, it's written down and they act as a form of contract with the, between the uh, customer and the analyst, okay? So basically the representative of the hospital will uh, write a signature in the, in, the, in the requirements document, not in the requirements document, but in another form of agreement, let's say, that uh, say, okay, what is written there, it's really what I want, okay? Then you have different forms of requirements, like the, you have the one that the customer can understand, and there are the ones that uh, are more detailed and more oriented to the system designer and the developers. Because this document, once it's written, uh, it is useful for the system designer. We, we pass to the second step. So you have your requirements document and the system designer needs to interpret what are the actual needs of the different stakeholder and needs to build the, the project of the software. So the system designer is like the architect, the software architect, the one that uh, I, I've, I've designed here, the house, to uh, represent the fact that uh, somehow I'm creating a project for something and not really developing at this time. It's like designing, for example, with UML, if you are familiar with that, or uh, CSML, if you are dealing with the more complex uh, hybrid systems. And uh, this project is passed on to the developer, the developers, of course. Here I put just one subject, but imagine that all the time here you have a team of people. And also I didn't include management people. We will see, we will see later on. But basically, after you have designed your software, uh, the developers have to, each, one, each developer has to build uh, a part of the software if, it's, uh, if it is very large, and they have to be, of course, integrated later on. 
Then you have your software, you produce your software, and afterwards, this software needs to be tested. So you need to verify that what the software does actually matches with the requirements. But then you have also to verify so you don't have bugs and you don't have uh, uh, both that uh, it runs correctly and uh, is in agreement with the specification. So this, when I speak about specification, I speak about as a synonym in this case of requirements that are not, they are not really synonym in practice, but for what we are concerned here, basically, when I speak about requirements, I speak about uh, specification for the software, okay? So the tester is checking that the software works, uh, works appropriately. And uh, but then you have to test with the customer. So you have to check that the customer is really satisfied and uh, that the analyst really understood what the customer wanted. And this is one of the most difficult thing to achieve because, of course, in this uh, line, in this path, uh, they have made they may uh, several incidents may have occurred, several misconceptions, several there are several different subjects involved. And uh, things uh, may have may have gone in the wrong direction, so the customer might not be satisfied. So the customer interact again with the, with the system analyst, and then requirements are updated. At this point, there is a system designer again, or the system maintainer that takes the role of maintainer. Could be the same person, could be another person that updates the project. And then the project is passed back to the developer, and this cycle continues. And it continues also when you have some new requests from the customer, because probably, like for one year, uh, we work with the with our with our system that controls the status of uh, of the people at home. But then we understand that uh, some additional symptoms is, is relevant. For example, I don't want to, to uh, monitor the coronavirus anymore. I want to monitor also for uh, this problem that is emerging that is affecting the skin of people. Okay, so I need to modify the software so that uh, uh, general practice doctors can also enter this type of symptoms or the people themselves can enter uh, this, uh, this type of symptoms, okay? So in this case, the customer goes again to the software company, requirements are updated, the designer, is redesigning the software and the developer develops. So this is like uh, in uh, in theory uh, how things should work. Of course, in practice, sh things work uh, in a much different manner. Everything is more chaotic uh, and is naturally more chaotic because uh, first of all, you have to uh, have the customer there. Uh, these, the customer don't always have time the customer is made of several stakeholders. Uh, uh, these stakeholders, uh, uh, they have to do their daily work. They're not always reachable. And uh, people in your company may have assumptions uh, So uh, and uh, may develop something that is not really what, uh, what was written in the requirements, for example. And uh, several other aspects uh, may happen. For example, your developer is new, is a newcomer, and is not expert enough for this type of system doesn't have a background for example in medical system device so it, there are a lot of uh, aspects that you have to take into account in this process okay so this is to give a brief uh, brief idea what uh, software engineering is dealing with is dealing with all these uh, uh, people and all these uh, artifacts so requirements software uh, testing is not represented here, but you have the tester and the design, the project, okay, the architecture. So, uh, in this scope, any question up to any question so far? No, no. Okay. So, um, so this is the, the basically our scope. So, in this scope what are the typical software engineering problems? So by software engineering problem, I mean uh, problems that uh, are asked to a software engineering researcher or to someone in the company who has a management role somehow of these different subjects, of these different developers and testers and uh, architects, etc. okay? Typical problems are this one, like uh, how can I find bugs in my code? So 
I, I see that my code for, for in, my, in my company, uh, in my software company, I see that uh, there is a lot of problems with this uh, software that crashes and uh, I need to find uh, uh, I need to find a way to identify more bugs. Uh, how can I improve my requirements? I see that uh, always uh, these requirements uh, are uh, wh whenever I come back to the customer, uh, they are never really uh, right. There, there is no way to uh, to get these requirements document in a proper way. Or I can see that every time I hand on this requirement to the developers, they just don't look at them and they uh, they get rid of the document and start uh, and start coding uh, because they, they say they don't understand the requirements. So how can I do with that? So this is another type of problem. Another type of problem in that same process. How can I improve the software development speed? So I can see that uh, everything works nicely and smoothly, but we are very slow in delivering. So one of the main requirements of the customer is I need this in this short time. And I need this early because uh, this uh, uh, outbreak is, uh, is spreading. So I need your solution for the uh, COVID-19 uh, in short time. So how can I improve the development speed also in this particular context, should I get rid of some uh, uh, or some um, or some parts of the process, for example, or other problem? How can I reduce the resources dedicated to testing? I see that, uh, like uh, in my team, I have uh, two developers and uh, three people in testing, and these are needed to achieve a code that doesn't have bug. But uh, I I'm feeling that I invest in too much in testing, and I could uh, invest more of the money in uh, in using people for developing using people is not uh, is not a good word but let's say in uh, having people uh, developing code instead of uh, having them uh, doing the the testing activity so and the tip these are typical software engineering problem to give you an idea of what uh, uh, questions can i ask in that context and these are the typical software solutions uh, if you don't consider empirical software engineering so if you don't take into account what is the main uh, scientific focus of, uh, of of software engineering so without a scientific lenses the typical answer for how can i find bugs in my code is this new testing environment will allow you to find all the bugs so there is uh, the solution is always find searching for some tool that solve my problem okay for example, I can now improve my requirements. Well, we can use a controlled natural language. So instead of writing the requirements in English or in Italian or in Italian or in French or German, we used a, we use a constrained language, a simplified language that is controlled and that is not ambiguous. So I, I'm sure that everyone will understand them clearly. Or for software development speed. Let's use this uh, new prototypical programming language. So let's uh, let's introduce a new programming language that, uh, for example, is easier for for everyone, and, and uh, let's uh, let the people deploy the code faster. For example, instead uh, of using Java, let's all use uh, uh, Python because so that instead of writing system out uh, uh, println, I, I can write. Uh, um, I can simply write print, and this will speed up the development. Uh, how can I reduce the resource dedicated to testing? Let's use model checking. This is a new technique, not new, but it's a technique for uh, replacing testing, basically, or at least this is the, the, the general hypothesis that you can replace uh, testing of the code with uh, uh, exploding the system space uh, and uh, searching for uh, uh, for particular states in this uh, in this uh, in the graph that represents all the software evolution, so uh, it's a solution, tool-based often solution that uh, try to solve my problem. But then, uh, in uh, this typical software engineering solution, received uh, like not so mm, uh, not so let's say happy answers or like uh, they, they did, we didn't uh, as a software engineering we didn't succeed in this direction in, in building tools that were solving the world problem actually uh, the the answer were this one in yellow like for example if the 
if, if I introduce a new testing environment, uh, I need to consider that it can be quite uh, complex to introduce a new tool in the team. So I have to train and I have to dedicate a lot of time instead of searching for bugs uh, to train the team in, uh, in, uh, in using this tool because it's very complicated and I don't have time to compare different tools and select the best one. So I have to, I need to, I need to consider always the time and cost uh, uh, aspect of the software process. How can I improve my requirements? Use a control natural language. Yes, but then I try the language and does not allow me to express what I want. So on the one hand, this control is not ambiguous, but on the other hand, I cannot write everything that the customer wants. For software development speed, well, yes, this uh, this programming, new prototypical programming language is very simple, very effective, but uh, it doesn't work on real cases. Like, uh, it's, it's okay in tiny programs, it may work, but uh, it doesn't work on real cases. And then, in the, and then for, for testing, let's use model checking, but then I try the model checker and I see, okay, but here I need a very good expert, a very, an expert in model checking, and it takes a lot of time to, 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 learn, uh, to learn this new tool. And the language that I have to use is too strict. So I have several problems that uh, uh, before I wanted to solve with uh, a general solution and uh, a general purpose solution, mostly based on a new tool or a new language, and uh, that required most of the time the, to disrupt the existing software process in a company, to change it radically. So this was not the direction to go. The illusion was that uh, given a problem, we would invent a solution and then make money, of course. We thought that our tiny solution would scale up to all real world cases. And we thought that uh, making quite successful simple example was sufficient to ensure that our idea for solving a software engineering problem was working. So the, the thing, the main problem was that we could pass, we thought we could pass from problem to solution and from theory to real practice, to real world uh, um, without basically uh, knowing the word, okay? So we thought we could change the word as it's written here without actually first studying the word and understanding better the problem space. What is the problem in the software engineering uh, development process? It, before we didn't ask this, we mostly asked, uh, we mostly focused on uh, a possible solution that would make us happy in a tiny, uh, in a tiny uh, working environment. The reality was that, of course, we were wrong because software development is complex, is constant dependent. As I said before, there are several stakeholders, so subjects that have some, uh, some relevance throughout the software process, different professionals, different needs, and different domains. Imagine that when you, when you think about software, uh, you are thinking about something that is both in your mobile phone and also in an aircraft and also in your washing machine. If you don't have a very old washing machine, you may have software also in that and also in your car. So all these domains, they all have uh, typical technical aspects uh, that uh, are all different. So. Uh, a mobile app to track your diet, diet is very different from uh, a software that controls uh, uh, a shuttle, okay? So different processes are needed for them and uh, different knowledge is needed. So the real uh, solution that works for every real world case doesn't exist, okay? Uh, and consider that uh, you have different contexts also in terms of companies because you may have a small company of just two people and you may have a very large company that a multinational company or a company yeah, like, like Google that, uh, uh, that is so large that uh, of course you don't know uh, much of what's going on in another branch of the company or your colleagues uh, and uh, the actual process that is carried out may be different even within the company. So even the, within branches of the company. One other, another very, very important point that uh, uh, you should consider 
also from your from your work maybe uh, is that you really start the development from scratch so uh, we always teach uh, we always teach students to start a program write down the, the code to, to solve a specific uh, to solve a specific problem but the reality is that uh, whenever you go to a company software already exists there and you have to refactor a software, extend the software. There is always a legacy system to refactor. Also, when, for example, in the example of the of the system to monitor the coronavirus, the the fact is that uh, very often the company that will be called to do that software most likely already has some interaction with the with the, with the doctors. He, the company already has uh, some software, some basic software for for the hospitals, because otherwise also uh, it is not possible to build everything uh, from scratch in short time. So you have always to consider that there is a past. This past is made of uh, contacts, but also made of uh, uh, existing software. And even in the rare cases in which the software to be developed is new, all the developers have specific backgrounds and skills that have an impact on the development. So if you are someone who's been working always on, uh, um, on web application and uh, you start uh, a new, you get off uh, the job in a railway company, you have to uh, develop software for the, for the railway company, uh, your background will influence the way you program and the role that you will have and uh, uh, of course the speed that you will have in developing in the specific context so these uh, are complexity dimensions that are very personal very subjective but have an impact on the whole software development process and the software engineers that is monitoring somehow this whole process should be considering this uh, uh, this personal aspect also you really know how the project will go as the context is surely going to change throughout the project. Again, it is good to consider the coronavirus example. The context now is uh, we need a system to monitor people at home. Should we all stay at home? No, probably this thing will change in a few weeks. So probably uh, new ideas will come to change the software, new needs will come to change uh, the software uh, after, after this period. So. Mm, and I don't know what this need will be. I gave before the example of the skin problem, uh, skin symptom to be added if another disease comes, but it could be also that I want to monitor, for example, the contacts of the people who already had the virus and the people that uh, didn't have the virus. And in this case, other problems rise, for example, privacy problems. So consider that uh, all these factors uh, make impossible to invent a simple solution that works for everyone both for testing for and th that is good for the testing of all system writing requirements of all system or uh, solving uh, the identification of bugs for all system it is it is very difficult to find uh, this uh, this type of solution so each particular context each company or each domain has a specific solution and uh, the thing was that uh, really in practice software engineering solution came from uh, research so we understood also that uh, before changing the world so before introducing new tools that may be needed to change the reality we should first learn about the world we should first learn what is the reality so observe before inventing and this is why empirical software engineering research, which is the topic of this course, is born. Empirical software engineering research is, let's read the slide, the use of a scientific method to investigate software engineering problems. And saying a scientific method, because there is no the scientific method, there's no only scientific method. And you will see that there are different techniques uh, to face different problems uh, all of them are flawed uh, and uh, you will learn these different scientific methods the only idea of scientific method uh, intended as a general way of thinking and general paradigm is that we start 
from the observation. So we observe the world, we formulate a hypothesis, so we try to think, uh, uh, make conjectures, try to think what will happen if I do something. I select a certain methodology to verify that my hypothesis is actually true and validate my hypothesis with respect to reality. This is the very old scientific method. So observe, create hypothesis, select a methodology for verification, and validate the hypothesis with respect to reality. This is a, a for, large form of experimentation somehow. The idea is that uh, in software engineering, if I can understand how things work in practice, I can always find a way to improve them. But if I just uh, have a vague idea what is the problem and I try to find the tools for solving it, this is not the right direction. So knowledge and understanding is not, you know, this is a, a particular thing that I want to, you to pay attention to. So while, uh, while you may think that things uh, finish there, like I start from observation, make an hypothesis, and then uh, I check the hypothesis old, uh, maybe the end of the path, actually knowing the reality through this scientific process is uh, oriented to solving real world problems because at the at the beginning there was always the set of questions from the from the developers from the people from the software engineering community asking to solve real world problem uh, so we have to know something to solve some problem and in our context also evaluating whether my solution to the problem observed have solved the problem is also in the scope of empirical software engineering. So empirical software engineering is both studying the reality, but also transforming the reality and checking that my transformation of the reality actually solved the existing problem, okay? I will give you an example of the cycle in the next slide. So as I said, we have, uh, uh, as I said, we have, uh, two spaces, I didn't say we have two spaces, but somehow I implied that we are considering uh, two, two spaces. One is the reality space, so the space of the, of the software process, the picture that I showed you before with the customer, with the developer, etc. That is the reality space. And then there is the theory space, the space of abstraction, the space in which I, uh, as a software engineering researcher, as I try to uh, understand what is the problem and uh, how to solve it. So the typical software engineering cycle consider, uh, consider these uh, uh, five steps. First step is always observe reality, okay? observe reality, for example, I have, uh, uh, I observe in a company that I have a lot of bugs in the software. And uh, I know that people in my company are working hours and hours, but still I have uh, lots of bugs. And uh, this is a problem for me, okay? Why is a problem? Because uh, it costs a lot. I can find several motivation for which this is a problem, but I want to solve it because uh, lots of bugs is not good, okay? Then I can start observing that I have all this bug. I can uh, uh, try to formulate a theory. So I create some hypothesis. I try to abstract from the reality and reason on why these things happen. Well, I can say bugs may be produced by too many hours uh, of work because uh, they say that people work a lot of hours. So I can think that uh, maybe all this working time does not have a good effect in the, in the quality of the code. Bugs may also be associated to complex code, for example. This uh, can be a, another hypothesis of why things are, uh, I, th there is a, a lot of bugs. So my coders are writing very long functions, for example, very complex function nested, and uh, they introduce bugs without considering them. These are problem theories. So uh, basically are ways to explain the problem that where do they come from? They come from uh, some inference, some uh, uh, observation, but also from my background as researcher, okay? Uh, from my 
also cultural background because maybe I instinctively say if you work too much, maybe you do it wrong, okay? Because you cannot focus enough. So the formulation of problem theory is very dependent on the on the person, and that's why you always have to evaluate the theory against reality. Okay, and you have always to evaluate the theory against the reality. And uh, uh, I want to check uh, whether there is a relation to the working time. And uh, I see that uh, actually there's no relation. The, the real relation is that uh, most of the bugs are introduced between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. And if I see that, uh, uh, if I check number of bugs in the code with respect to how long is the code and the code complexity, I see that there's no real relation. So it seems that uh, one hint from reality, uh, pro from the observation of reality, shows me that probably the complexity of code is not related to the number of bugs in my context. And I see that actually what is related to the number of bugs is the time when these uh, people are programming. If people program by night, it seems that they introduce bug, and during the day they don't introduce bug. As at this point, I have understood in practice what may be the source of my problem. So I can pass to formulate a possible theory. I want to solve this problem by basically preventing developer for working at night. So I see the bugs are in the night at night. So Let's let's put a system that does not allow them to work them to work in the night. So they don't stay at the office at night. They cannot upload the software from home at night. So they cannot work between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. This is a constraint that I want to enforce, and uh, I uh, solve the problem with uh, an actual system, a system that uh, uh, that blocks. Basically, they, a system intended both as a software system that doesn't allow them to upload, for example, and also a system made of uh, rules, a set of rules that tell them, hey, guys, do not program between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. You are not allowed. You won't get paid for the time that you spent programming at that time. Then I have to check if this solution works because, again, here I am uh, in the theory space. I didn't check against reality. So I have to need to evaluate the solution against reality. And I say, hey, if this program don't, if these people don't program at night, actually I see that uh, uh, I am able to reduce the number of bugs. So this is, this is a very good, uh, very good outcome. But on the other hand, I see that I cannot meet the delivery deadline. So, so uh, this comes from another observation of reality. So after I built my solution, this is not enough. I have to check that uh, I uh, th that no additional problems have been introduced because I have somewhat uh, transformed the reality. And I need to observe that my transformation somehow didn't introduce some uh, uh, some novel problem, so that my solution didn't create more problem than the one that it solved. At this at this point, I have a new problem that I cannot meet the delivery deadlines beso beside the other one. So it seems that development speed uh, may be lower during the day because uh, if uh, this is a, a possible theory for uh, for my problem, so for my new problem, because because I have understood, I have seen that. Uh, I forbid the people to, before I was meeting the delivery deadline and people were working day and night, but during the night, they were introducing a lot of bugs, okay? The run speed may be lower during the day, so, because now they cannot, uh, they, they cannot, uh, they cannot program at night. So let's evaluate this theory against the reality. Uh, and I see that actually there is more correct code during the day, but slower speed. And in the night, there are more bugs, but faster speed. So I get more code, more code delivered, but more buggy code. So how can I solve this, uh, this problem? I need to dedicate more testing resources for code developed at night. So it is not possible to forbid the people to working at night because they seem to be more productive. But the solution that I can find is that instead 
of uh, instead of forbidding people to work at night to have correct code, add more testing resource for coding development at night. So I invest some money for uh, the testing resources instead of reducing the effort uh, of the people during the night. I check this solution and I see that I have less bugs and I have at the same time also more software so I can meet the delivery timeline. So this is the typical cycle of empirical software engineering. So start from reality, formulate a problem theory, check that my theory actually works against the reality, then try, so check that uh, my theory is right, basically, then try to formulate a solution theory, and finally try to evaluate the solution uh, against, uh, against the reality, okay? So, and, and see, observing the reality again, that I didn't uh, interfere with other aspects. So the typical software engineering problems, after introducing this type of cycle, this new way of thinking, they do remain the same. It's still, how can I find these bugs in the code? How can I improve the requirements? How can I reduce the resources dedicated to testing? And how can I improve software development speed and all the other uh, type of problems related to the stakeholders, uh, to, the, to the task of the software process? So problem is the same. But the typical software engineering solution today is more based on understanding the reality. So if someone asks, how can I improve my requirements, instead of proposing a new language that is, uh, uh, instead of being English, it's a, it's a constrained way of writing in English, is a restricted English, is a simplified English, uh, I first ask, let's see how you write your requirements now. I ask the company, the specific company, to see uh, what is the form of the requirements, and I start from that reality. And I want to see what are the main quality problems of the requirements. So I may see that, for example, actually <clears throat> the requirement language is clear. So I don't need, uh, I don't need uh, uh, a language for making them less ambiguous because it's very, everything is very clear. It's just that they are incomplete because you didn't meet probably enough with the customer. So I am asking, how many meetings do you normally do with your customer? Well, you may say one meeting, just one minute at the beginning and then, and then that's it, okay. Let's do another thing. Instead of uh, introducing a new, a new technology, let's try to schedule a meeting each week to revise the requirements with the customer. So the idea here is that I don't even need to introduce a new software to solve my problem. I just need to manage the thing in a different way. So let's meet with the customer each week to revise the requirements. So to interact with the customer more frequently because he will change his mind and uh, uh, also the reality will change. So because dynamism is one of the most typical aspects of the software engineering and you have to take into account that uh, you always have to continuously interact uh, uh, with people. So the way of approaching problem is different, but you have to consider in this example, I am always speaking about an interaction with a specific customer. So with, uh, uh, <clears throat> and I'm proposing a context specific solution that derives from reality and uses a scientific method. So the reality is of course, the reality that is observable, is the reality of my client or a set of clients, set of customers. And uh, a typical scientific solution use the scientific method, but which method? Well, uh, Consider this image. Software engineering is a, is a strange creature because uh, as I was speaking to you, uh, I was uh, speaking about mostly stakeholders. I didn't mention software soft. Why? Because uh, mm, software engineering as a discipline has a very strong uh, uh, technical facet because uh, it, is, uh, it, 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 it involves uh, developers, testers, so people who know about software development and software is uh, is a very technical thing but on the other hand it has also human and social face it uh, human and social uh, uh, profile why because uh, you have different stakeholders coming from different domain but you have also a lot of people involved uh, in the organization and in the development of software software is not developed by one person in his own room 
uh, software for a car or uh, for any 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 software that you might use even in your mobile requires the participation of uh, a minimum of two or three people uh, also for the tiniest thing so whenever you uh, you have to consider something bigger uh, you need a structure you need management and uh, this management has to deal with ever changing requirements uh, and uh, the difference for example with other engineering domain for example the requirements of uh, a house are the same for uh, have been the same for for a long time you may have some specific requirements uh, that uh, that you need to address in a specific context because maybe you want more windows etc but in the end the higher level requirement is always uh, uh, you you need to, uh, you need to have repair from the from the rain you need you need to be heated and you ne need to be have enough light you need to sleep there and you need to go to the toilet and you need to cook these are and you need uh, to relax and you need space for all these activities these are the general requirements of a house but for software, uh, general requirements always depend, may be radically different. And you, because uh, as I told before, you have a spacecraft uh, software that, uh, for example, as a, as a goal, the one of go, uh, reaching the moon, or the, the diet software in your app that uh, has a, as a goal reducing your, uh, reducing your, um, your weight. So you have a, a lot of space for, uh for variety let's say and this of course uh, uh, involves uh, uh, humans involves uh, people involves uh, uh, the human facet of software development so we need to take empirical method both from the hard sciences so from uh, physics math biology let's say but also from social sciences so from those sciences like political science, sociology, uh, and uh, this type, uh, this type of science that involve uh, the study of uh, the people. So on one hand, we have to study uh, hard things like, for example, the code, the running time of the code, for example, but also we have to study the feeling of the people, the, under, the way the people understand things. And in this case, it is more useful to use uh, methods coming from the uh, social sciences. Methods from the art sciences are mostly quantitative. So I normally deal with numbers, okay? Uh, methods from social sciences are mostly qualitative and uh, you normally deal with words. You will learn about these different methods, both from hard science and from social science. For example, here you have a list of methods. There is no, um, let's say, mm, no one uh, way of, uh, uh, of calling these methods. These are just example. You have, for example, experiments with so human subjects. Experiments with human subjects, uh, it's simply uh, an experiment similar to the ones that you may have uh, for medicines, okay? For example, if you have uh, to test a medicine, you take, uh, let's say 20 people and you give them a certain a certain medicine and to the other 20 people you give a placebo okay uh, in, in software engineering the same thing you can do it with a tool for testing for example to 10 people i give uh, this uh, typical tool for this uh, new tool for testing and the other 10 people they use the old uh, testing tool okay and i compare for example how many bugs they find within one hour in my experiment okay to understand whether the soft, which one of the software is better, but I'm testing with human subjects, okay? I can do an experiment just with software subjects. So for example, I have uh, uh, to compare different, uh, different uh, in, instead of wanting to compare the speed of the people in using a certain testing tool, I have uh, some automated uh, tool that uh, does not rely, a just push button does not rely on people, and uh, I want to compare, let's say, 10 tools that do automated testing. And uh, in this case, the experiment is with software subject and because I'm comparing these tools. I'm not involving humans because as a, as a input, 
I'm using, for example, uh, a bunch of code that I know for which I know that, that I have certain bugs. So I check just which one is the tool that is in itself faster and also how many bugs uh, they are able to find. In other cases, I may need to do a survey. A survey is a questionnaire, basically. And uh, for example, because I want to know uh, which are the most typical bugs in your company, maybe I have to deal with a multinational company and they have to understand uh, where to focus my investment for training, for example, for training the developer to avoid certain specific type of bugs, but I don't know which are the typical bugs. So I do a survey with the testing team to understand what are the problems. So a questionnaire, I distribute a questionnaire. Uh, in some cases, maybe it's not a very well-focused problem. So I so well-focused like type of bugs, type of most, uh, most typical bugs, but uh, it's, more, uh, it's more related to the relationship, let's say, that people have. I see that people in that team are really, in, the, in that team are really uh, frustrated. They, they, don't, uh, they don't deliver and they seem unhappy. And uh, I want to understand uh, what's the reason why, what are the triggers for frustration. And in this case, uh, I perform uh, uh, another type of study. It's so-called interview study, or uh, and then I do some ethnography. So I participate to the environment. I try to understand, and it's different from doing a survey. It's different from doing an experiment because I'm dealing with people and I'm dealing with the real world. Other cases, maybe uh, judgment study, case study, field study, or literature reviews. You, you will see this uh, uh, during the lecture. I don't go in deep into, into each definition of the type of studies, but uh, uh, we, 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 will see, uh, we will see probably at the, at the next lecture an overview of the different types uh, uh, of studies uh, with, the, with the presentation of, the, of a paper that was published last year at the main software engineering conference, at the, uh, software, sorry, it was presented in a journal and then presented also at this main software engineering conference that is called the ABC of software engineering research that tries to, let's say, uh, introduce uh, which are the typical software engineering methods that put them together according to a sound framework. So we will see these different, uh, these different methodologies. So let's come to a goal of this course and then we make a break. So the goal of this course is to learn these methods that are commonly used in empirical software engineering research. So you will learn some quantitative methods like experimentation and some qualitative methods like interviews and ethnography and the ground theory and some terminology will be given later on. Uh, you will learn when it is appropriate to use a certain scientific method. So when it is appropriate to do a quantitative investigation and when it, it, it is more appropriate to look at qualitative data and when do you need to mix the methods all together to understand what is the reality. And uh, uh, so you will learn also uh, how to combine these different methods. Always keep in mind that all these methods, so experiments, surveys, interviews, uh, uh, judgment studies, uh, review of literature are all flawed. Why? For example, in experiments, a real world environment is always simplified as I have to focus only on a specific set of variables. Uh, for example, in the case of the people using, um, using a certain tool for testing, I of course uh, have to set up uh, the same, uh, I have to use the same code, and uh, it, the code cannot be representative of all reality. Okay, the code to the bug. People may have uh, uh, interacted with similar codes, may, people may have different experience. So I have to check that uh, uh, there is always uh, this, there, there is a balance in the experience of the people, but reality is different because in reality, I might have uh, people that, uh, that have. Uh, uh, only novice, for example, unbalanced, uh, unbalanced level of experience. So is, uh, the experimental environment is always a simplified uh, version of, uh, of reality that focuses on uh, specific variables, okay? Surveys, uh, the questionnaire, people tend to say what they think and not what they do. 
and uh, uh, it is uh, it is quite hard to be sure that they have correctly understood the question so understanding if they actually understood what was asked to them and their questions are and the answer are reliable is not easy for interviews and ethnography uh, there is always a researcher bias when if you, if you think about uh, going in a company and study and deriving theories from observing you unavoidably put yourself in the middle so experiments uh, may allow you to be objective but if you interview, you are part of the you are part of the uh, problem, part of the solution. You intervene in the reality. Case studies, uh, which are particular type of studies typical of software engineering, in which uh, you basically go to a company and uh, try to understand the problem for in that company and possibly find a solution for the specific company, are always hard to generalize and uh, uh, to. to other companies because everyone has his own context and it's always hard to separate the environment from uh, <clears throat> the unit of analysis so if you want to analyze for example the bugs in the code you cannot separate them from the authors the, of the code from the history of the code so reality is interwoven and while experiment try to create barriers between elements of reality in case studies uh, uh, it is always difficult because you have to deal with uh, with the real field okay so uh, the the issue is never stick to methodological purity so don't think that your results for any method uh, uh, would be uh, the the real results so you have some confirmation of your theory but uh, you're never sure okay also consider that there is no uh, taxonomy for this method so you may find i will try to uh, give you synonyms for things try to remember the names of experiments surveys interviews case studies but uh, in some cases uh, you may have uh, a mix uh, between uh, between names and some synonyms used so uh, I understood that uh, I, I thought that uh, most of the participants were coming from uh, statistics, from a background in statistics. So I, I tailored these courts uh, considering these aspects, but I understand that uh, you are coming also from different curricula. So uh, basically, uh, you all uh, need to know um, the content of this course because uh, uh, it is a real world application of statistical competencies. And uh, most of all, is a way of approaching software and software engineering as scientists. And uh, you will learn methods that may be useful for you uh, in research, but can also be useful for you in, uh, in the reality, in the job reality. For example, if you need to do some market research in companies to understand uh, what is the feeling uh, of people about uh, a certain product, that can be a software product or another product, doesn't matter, you may need uh, uh, the skills that you will learn in this, uh, in this um, course. And it can help you also to improve your skills uh the your your issues your <clears throat> to improve your skills as problem solvers as problem solver uh that are always needed in any in any company both in software engineering and in other in other contexts so this is uh, an outline of the course and uh, uh i'm i will start with an overview of empirical methods so i will uh, Give you this overview today uh, then i will pass to uh, describing interviews and ethnography which is a qualitative method is quite lightweight to understand and it's interesting then uh, i will uh, speak about surveys so questionnaires then i will explain you how to do systematic literature reviews this is important for uh, any study that you do is very research oriented but it is uh, uh, it is something that uh, you need uh, you need to consider because as i told uh, if you remember when i was speaking about the um, the process uh, the software process uh, uh, the, the the typical software engineering process uh, uh, i said uh, okay now you create some theory okay some hypothesis that explain a certain situation and uh, uh, it is true that this hypothesis needs to be derived also not just from your background but from literature 
So understanding the literature, understanding the scientific background on a certain problem is fundamental. So you will need to learn for systematic literature reviews because it's helpful to create possible hypotheses based on existing theory. Then you will learn qualitative data analysis methods and uh, you will uh, learn quantitative uh, data analysis methods, so experiments, quasi-experiments, and hypothesis testing. You will see, probably, I don't know if there will be time, but uh, I would like to teach you about uh, mining software repositories. And finally, uh, probably I will anticipate case studies before mining software repositories because it's more relevant and for, for your context and uh, action research. So, go into a company and uh, try to uh, transform the process, try to introduce uh, a new way of doing things and uh, how to verify it. Okay, this is the reference book and uh, you, can, uh, you can find it uh, in Amazon, you can find it probably some edition and some, uh, you can find it also in, uh, in internet if you, if you search in form of ebook. E so this is the reference book. Okay, and then I will start. Uh, uh, I will start this after after we do a little break. Okay.